So how could you tell looking at this pump what the flow in head should be for this system? We talked about the pumping equation and how the key operating parameters that you would plug into that would be the, the flow in the head or pressure. And it's important to remember that that pump is part of a system that includes its distribution. And what's included in that distribution loop is really going to set what that flow and head need to be for that system. So the flow is a little bit more straightforward, and that's going to be determined by your heat exchange devices. So by design, the chiller evaporator barrel is going to have some target flow to accomplish the heat exchange it needs to have. And same thing with the load side or the coil side. But head or pressure is a, is a little bit less straightforward. We're going to go through a typical piping network, uh, maybe a simplified diagram here to kind of show what those rules of thumbs are and how you might hands in your pocket, make some determination on the sizing of a pump in your building. So the first thing we start with is those heat exchanger devices, and those are typically high pressure drop because of the surface area and the curls and passes that are included in some of these devices. You're trying to get as much time and space against these working fluids in this indirect heat exchange. So that, as you might expect, is going to cause a little bit of additional pressure drop relative to some of these other components. So there's published manufactured data about what a typical air handling unit coil or a chiller evaporator barrel, what those pressure drops are going to be at different flows and different conditions. But there's some rules of thumb that we can use for our purposes just to kind of put some numbers against the system that you're looking at and make some initial determination. So 7 to 10 foot for a typical commercial HVAC chiller barrel might be in the right neighborhood. Air handler coil 10 to 15 feet, depending on size. Those are good places to start. And then for a control valve, so here we have a two-way control valve at the discharge of the air handling unit. So what might you think that pressure drop is going to be? In this case, would it be a foot? Would it be two feet? Well, there's this idea of authority in HVAC controls that we actually want to have a very similar pressure drop relative to the air handling unit coil or the load so that we have a fair amount of linearity in our control so that when we pop the valve open 5%, we don't now have 80% of the flow going through there because of the low pressure drop. We want to have a similar pressure drop so we can have some proportionality in how we open the valve and how much load we're varying through that coil. So we also have the piping network itself, and that could be substantial or less so. If you have something like an air-cooled chiller and a mechanical yard that pipes right through the wall to a single air handling unit, that might not be much relative to your heat exchanger pressure drops. But if you have something like a high-rise or a, a huge building that's going to have um, you know, thousands and thousands of feet of, of piping, that's going to be a different story. So there's a engineering way to do this where we would use something like the Moody diagram and for a given velocity and roughness estimate piping diameter and length of piping we would actually determine the pressure drop in this way but for our purposes there's again some industry rule of thumb that we can use so anywhere from between one and four foot of pressure drop per 100 feet of pipe length might be a way that you would estimate what that what that feet of head needed by your pump just for the friction loss in the piping would be. So what else do you have in your system? Well, you got things like these isolation valves here that are going to be around some of your more major pieces of equipment. You're going to have things like balance valves, especially where you have multiple loads, but even in this case where you have the single air handling unit, you might have a three-way valve so you can maintain some constant flow through your system. And then that balance valve similarly is going to be equal sized or should be balanced so that it matches roughly the pressure drop going through your load, your air handling coil. You'll have things like, uh, in addition to a circuit setter balancing valve, you might have something like a triple duty valve or something at the discharge of the pump that you can balance your flow. Triple duty valve has other features. It acts as a check valve and as an isolation valve around that chiller and around that pump. But in either case, there's going to be a pressure drop associated with that, even at full open. And here's what some of those balancing devices might look like. Triple duty valve, circuit setters, 
We also have things like drain valve located throughout the system. Going to be used for maintenance purposes. Might be a source of leaks. So you might want to pay attention to that. And then there'll be a number of T's and elbows running through this system. And instead of counting the pressure drop across each of those, there's another rule of thumb that says somewhere between 5 and 10% of your pipe length, you may want to add that to the distribution calculation that you use to determine what that pressure drop is. So some other components we talked about in the hydronic system, something like an air water separator that's going to help remove entrained air, uh, protect pumps and other pieces of equipment and oper act as a water makeup point in your system. Expansion tanks that as the temperature changes in the system, you have density changes of the water and you have some type of air bladder in that tank that allows for expansion and contraction of your system. You'll have typically in the plant some type of chemical pot feeder, which is a point to test and add chemicals to your system. So things like corrosion inhibitors, something to handle scaling. Um, that's that's going to be something that you may see as this very thin bypass that should be valved off when it's not in use, but when you're adding chemicals, would be opened up and circulated through your system. And you might even see for a smaller system something like a buffer tank. So say in a chill water system where you have a chiller that is not able to go to a low enough load to handle all of your conditions, you might have something like a buffer tank that adds additional capacity to your system, stretches out those on-off times of your chiller, and allows you to leverage the thermal momentum of your piping distribution and the water inside rather than have to short cycle your equipment. You also have a number of control devices and gauges like this pressure gauge across the pump and the pump strainer. You'll have uh, temperature sensors throughout the system that may be standalone or sent to your automation system. There's also going to be these removable strainers that should be upstream of any important piece of equipment like a pump or a coil and those are able to be cleaned and hopefully you have a gauge somewhere around there that you can check and see if you have a clog strainer if that needs to be removed and replaced or sprayed out. So this is what that strainer device looks like at the inlet of a centrifugal pump. So it's part of a suction diffuser and we pause on this because we want to point out how once you discharge from the suction diffuser and you leave the strainer there's a certain amount of minimum head or minimum pressure that you need to have going into the pump or you might have a situation called cavitation. So remember we talked about with our pressure gradient you leave the pump at a certain head and that at each of these incremental pressure drops and lengths of pipe you're going to slowly or gradually or maybe punctuated for the equipment be dropping down how much pressure you have in your system and by the end of that so right if you have a suction diffuser right at the end of that strainer the pump manufacturers are going to require for a specific flow that you have a minimum amount of pressure and that's called the net positive suction head that's going to be required in order to prevent cavitation so what is cavitation well what happens it gets a little bit quirky but when you have water that's moving at high velocity through the eye of the impeller, the higher velocity that you move at, the lower the pressure the fluid is at, and you can get at a pressure lower than the vapor pressure of the fluid. And when that happens, you'll actually phase change from the liquid stage to the vapor stage. So in this picture, the vapor bubbles is not in entrained air. This is actually liquid water turned into vapor that forms at the eye impeller at those very high velocities as you move through that small orifice. So it won't stay vapor forever as we remember from our pump construction as you move across the impeller and that water is getting flung towards the edge of the pump casing where it will crash and lose some of its acceleration you have these vapor bubbles collapsing and as they collapse they can do a fair amount of damage. So here's an impeller that's had this cavitation pretty much eat away at the tips of the impeller blades you can kind of tell that distinctive almost popcorn sound that you might have at the pump but this is one factor that goes into designing our pumps and one reason why if you have an oversized pump that is not throttled or balanced that you can what's called run out its curve and we'll show what that looks like on the pump curve and you can have this cavitation condition that'll 
ruin your impeller and affect the performance of your pump. So again, just keep in mind that flow and head are those two key operating parameters. Flow as indicated by design and by the equipment and heat exchangers that you need in your system. And then head is going to be estimated by the design engineer. But one key thing that we want to point out is that it's the actual head that your system is going to operate at that's going to determine the flow and the performance of your pump. And we'll see that on the next video with the pump curve.